Okay, so we're back. Uh, 1.5 is on inverse functions. And to show something, to, to show that two functions are inverses of each other, we need the cancellation equations. Okay. And uh, basically, f and g are inverses if they satisfy the following criteria. So the cancellation equations um, say that if uh, f is the inverse of g, or vice versa, then uh, f of g of x will equal x for all x in the domain of g. And then uh, g of f of x will equal x for all x in the domain of f. Okay. So in this case, um, f is uh, the inverse of g, which you can write as g with this little negative 1 in the uh, stratosphere. Okay, it's not like a exponent, it's a, strictly a notation. Okay, so g inverse is the way you would read this. You wouldn't say g to the negative first power. Okay, so 1 over g to the x is not the same as g inverse, typically. Uh, sometimes it is. But, so anyways, uh, let's dive in here and look at using this thing. Nine times out of ten, it's pretty easy. Uh, it, everything goes very nicely, but then there's always that one time where it doesn't work so well, right? So we want to look at that one time where it doesn't work so well. Um, okay, so I have x minus, square root of x minus 4. Um, g of x is x squared plus 4, um, where we have x greater than or equal to 0. The implied domain of f of x, we need x minus 4 to be greater than or equal to 0. In other words, x to be greater than or equal to 4. Okay, okay. Um, so we want to do the cancellation. Let's look at f of g of x. So I'm putting g of x inside of f of x. So I have the square root of, instead of x, I put in g of x. So there's g of x. And then minus 4. That equals the square root of x squared. And then if the square root of x squared, you have to be careful, right? That's the absolute value of x. Um, we need to make sure this equals x for x in the domain of g. So the domain of g... is what? It, it was uh, x greater than or equal to 0. Okay, So it, basically they're saying anything that I put into here, any of the numbers x that I put in here are going to be positive numbers. So if you put like 5 in there, what's the absolute value of 5? It's just 5. Put 10 in there, what's the absolute value of 10? It's just 10. So if you put x in there, the absolute value of x in that case will be x. So it's kind of a, a little technicality there in this, this problem you have to be careful about. Well, like I said, 9 times out of 10, they're, they're pretty silly. Um, let's do the other way around now. So I'll have the square root of x minus 4 squared plus 4. Um, the domain of f of x really doesn't matter that much here, except you know you can't put things that are negatives and radicals. Um, squaring a square root will give you x minus 4, and then plus 4, and that will equal x. Okay? Um, so again, that, that will work in, in this particular domain, in particular the domain of f of x, which is x greater than or equal to 4. So it's not that, you know, it has to equal x, um, like, everywhere. It's not like this. Like, this is y equals x. It's just that it has to equal x on the domain of the function that's going inside of it. Okay, so you could have it equaling x, but x is restricted like this guy was. Um, 
right here, right? So x is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so that's one of the, the harder ones. Like I said, usually it's just a matter of uh, algebra and they work out real nice. Okay. Um, existence of inverses. How do I know something has an inverse? Um, there's kind of the the uh, hardcore mathematician from 19 from the 1900s version, uh, where you'll suppose f of uh, x1 equals f of x2, and you'll show um, that x1 equals x2. Okay, and basically what that says is that it's one to one. Okay, so if some, a function is one to one, then it's invertible. So if one to one, then invertible. And what I've just given you there is the definition, this part A here, is the definition of a function which is invertible. Basically, if f of x1 equals f of x2, then x1 has to equal x2. Okay. Um, Let's let's before we get into that, let's let's build some intuition. Okay, so let's just look at one to oneness. Uh, so with regards to the um, relations and the arrow diagrams, um, let's take a look at this guy. Okay, this guy is. Uh, let's put another dot in there. This guy is a function, but it's not one to one. Okay, let me get rid of that third dot there. It's a function, and you see every element in the x, every element in the domain here, goes to exactly one element in the range. Okay, but it's not one to one. I could write one to one like that. Okay, looks like one minus one, but it's one to one. Okay. Um, why isn't one to one? And it's because of this guy right here. Okay, so these uh, this y value it has two different things going to it, and that's bad. That means it's not one to one. Okay? Um, so what would be one to one? One to one things are really really well behaved. So to be one to one, everything over here has to go to just one thing on the other side. Basically, that's all you can do. Um, one way to think about it, it's a function in both directions. So if you think about going from here to here, you can't have any of that splitting, right? You can't have any of this crazy business where it splits in the two directions. But also in the other direction, you have to avoid splitting as well. So you can't have one point in the Y in the, in the range going to two different places like this guy here we circled. Okay. Okay, um, let's see, maybe another way to think of it is the, the there's a, like a horizontal line test. Okay, so first, I guess this would be the, the what do we call these, the, the graph, the arrow diagrams. When you're looking at the actual graphs of your, your functions, um, there's a horizontal line test you can do. Okay. And that will tell you whether or not it's one to one. So um, this guy right here is one to one because for any horizontal line I draw, it only hits the graph in one place. So is one to one. Some graphs that are functions are not one to one. So this guy right here, the parabola that we said was a function last time, turns out it's not one to one. It's not technically invertible unless you restrict its domain. Okay. Okay, so what does that really mean algebraically, getting back to now to this uh, part A definition, f of x1 equals f of x2 implies x1 equals x2. Here I have an x1 and I have an x2, but um, f of x1 uh, equals f of x2. I shouldn't have said but, I mean f of x1 equals f of x2, that y-coordinate is the same, the height at those 
of those points is the same. But uh, x1 is not equal to x2. Okay? So for one to one is to hold, you need, if f of x1 equals f of x2, x1 and x2 better be the same thing. Otherwise, you're out of luck. Okay, okay. so um, you can think of it in terms of the horizontal line test, but there's kind of this more technical way of showing it that I'll just introduce you to. I won't hold you accountable for it unless you want to go on to become a math major. Then you need to be able to do this stuff. Okay. But uh, proving that something is one to one will look a bit like this. Prove um, this function f of x equals 3x plus 1 is one to one. Okay. Okay, so how would this work? Um, so I'm going to write proof. Um, suppose, you always start proofs with supposing something. Suppose x1 and x2 are randomly selected uh, integers, or rather real numbers, right? We're working with real numbers. Randomly selected, we'll just say numbers. And then we want to show, if we suppose um, this f of x1 equals f of x2, that x1 will in fact equal x2. And we can show that using algebra. Okay? So we use algebra to kind of connect these. Okay. okay, so suppose x1 and x2 are randomly selected numbers. And then further suppose um, that f of x1 equals f of x2. Okay, uh, then we're going to use algebra. So note what is f of x1 equaling f of x2 imply. We do substitution using the original function. That means 3x1 plus 1 equals 3x2 plus 1. And then we use algebra to show that x1 is equal to x2. So I subtract 1 from both sides. 3x1 is 3x2. Divide both sides by 3. So x1 equals x2, which is what we want to show. Okay. okay, so in other words, uh, this thing is 1 to 1. Hence, f of x is 1 to 1. And if something is 1 to 1, it's invertible. So hence, f of x is invertible. Okay, so um, that, that would be a proof. If you want to get better at proofs, uh, sometimes discrete math will help you there. If you take a discrete math class, um, sometimes the discrete math classes are so geared towards the computer scientists, they won't. So you may have to take like an official proof class or maybe an intro to uh, more advanced math kind of class. And usually they have like the Ohio state will have something like that. If you get really into math, you can take those classes. Okay, okay. Um, let's look at uh, something and just determine if it's one to one. So is f of x one to one? And this, this case will be more like what I would be expecting you to be able to do. Okay, so y equals sine of 3x over 2. Um, there, the, what's the period? So the period is wedged in between uh, 0 and 2 pi. So multiply everything by 2 thirds. I need to cut that in the four parts. So I'm going by pi over 3s. And if you want to challenge yourself, you can always pause the video and uh, try to do it on your own and then see if you get what I get. So I'm, I'm just graphing it. And that goes on forever in both directions. Okay, so is it one to one? And well, heck no. No, it's not. It fails the horizontal line test miserably. Okay? Any uh, horizontal line in the appropriate range will will hit the function in an infinite number of places. 
Okay? So it's not one to one. But that doesn't mean all hope is lost, right? Um, you can restrict the domain to make it one to one, and that's how we're going to get inverse trigonometric functions. So section three, inverse trig functions. Okay, so for example, um, cosine, which looks like this, um, is not one to one, but if we restrict the domain from uh, zero to pi, then it will pass the test, right? So you'll just have this part of the graph that I'm drawing over in blue. Okay. And then that passes the horizontal line test. Okay. So um, y, y uh, equals cosine x, but we're going to restrict the domain to 0 to pi. Okay. And then we can invert it. And of course, to invert it, you kind of do a rotation about the line y equals x. And this is kind of a weird rotation. But it'll end up looking like this. Okay. Um, so now the domain is from uh, negative 1 to 1, and the range is from 0 to pi. So that'll be y equals arc cosine of x, which is also equivalently written, written as cosine inverse x. Those are the same. Okay, okay so great. Um, we could do this with all the trig functions, and they all have kind of their same or, or rather uh, different uh, restrictions. Um, the restrictions are kind of arbitrarily made and agreed upon. Okay, so you could restrict the cosine to other domains and it would be invertible, but mathematicians have agreed upon zero to the pi is kind of the best uh, for so cosine. For sine, they agreed on uh, the domain from negative pi over two to the pi over two. And then for tan, uh, the domain, uh, at, uh, open parentheses there, um, open parentheses, negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And then the co-functions are kind of attached to, it's like, like the, the interval for cotangent is uh, kind of similar to cosines. Okay? But uh, you can look those up in the book if you need them. Okay, okay so let's look at some, some of these, some examples. Okay? For example, the arc sine of one half. So it's asking, basically, the sine of what angle equals one half is kind of the question in the cloud. Okay? Um, there's an infinite number of answers, but the range, the output of arc sine is restricted. It's the range of arc sine, so if you have y equals uh, arc sine of x, its range will be the domain of sine of x. So its range will be from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. So you're looking for answers in that range, just like the range of cosine inverse or arc cosine is going to be from 0 to pi. Okay, so th yeah, there's an infinite number of answers for this um, for this theta, uh, but you only want the ones in the range from negative pi over two to the pi over two. Okay, okay so the reference angle that gives you one half is uh, pi over six, and t for it to be positive, you need the angle in the first quadrant. Okay, so it's pi over six. Uh, maybe another one. So arc cotan of negative root 3. Okay. So um, this is kind of begging the question, the cotan of what angle is equal to negative root 3? Okay. And for cotan, our uh, range is going to be like the range of, of co cosine. So the range will go from 0, but not including 0, 
to uh, pi, not including pi. Okay, and you can look that up in the book as well. So you want the angle in that range um, that gives you negative root three. So the reference angle for cotan of theta equaling root just root three is going to be. Um, I guess it's pi over 6 again, isn't it? So it's pi over 6. But we don't want this angle here. We want the angle that's going to give us a negative value. Okay, so we want this angle over here in the second quadrant. And what is this? This is 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, 5 pi over 6. Okay, so the answer is 5 pi over 6. Okay, um, using right triangles to solve these problems. Uh, for example, sine of arc tan of 3 over 4. Okay, so what you're going to do is kind of draw a right triangle in that range. So our tan this time is going from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Okay, And to draw a triangle in there, it's either going to be in this quadrant or it's going to be in the lower quadrant based on whether or not the number is negative. Okay? And because it's positive over positive, it's in the first quadrant. So it's this right triangle here, okay. the white one. I also drew a green one if you're colorblind. Um, there's one below it. I'll put it in blue. I went over it in blue, so hopefully you can see it now. Um, or you just wouldn't be able to see the color. Okay, that's okay. in blue now. So we want the white right triangle. Arc tan, um, inside of it, what's going on the inside here is the ratio of sides of a right triangle, right? So um, it's going to be opposite over... Um, adjacent. Right. So opposite must be 3, and then adjacent must be 4. So the bottom uh, line is 4. Okay. Let me extract that triangle and draw it a little better. Okay. Triangle, so the opposite is 3, and the adjacent is 4. Then to get to the third side, you use Pythagorean theorem. Right? So a squared plus b squared is c squared where A is a leg, B is a leg, and C is a hypotenuse. So this is a hypotenuse. All right, so put in 3. Um, squared is 9, plus 4 squared is 16. C squared. So C is going to be the square root of 25, which is 5. And if you know a lot about triangles, a special 3, 4, 5 triangle, right? Okay. Um, so then we need to take the sine of this angle here. Okay, so sine then is what? Well, sine is opposite over hypotenuse, so this must be 3 all over 5. You just take opposite and then all over hypotenuse 5. Let's look at another one. Um, cosecant of arctan of negative 5 twelfths. So this time, uh, again, where arctan is in this range, from negative pi over 2 to the pi over 2. Uh, we want tan, um, the triangle, which is negative, so it's going to be this triangle this time. Okay, So it's the opposite side. So there's theta in there. The opposite side is the negative side. Okay, So it's uh, opposite over hypotenuse. So negative 5 is right here, smushing it in over, um, sorry, opposite over adjacent, and then 12 is right here. So let me extract the triangle. So negative 5 and 12. And then to get to the third side, we do the Pythagorean uh, theorem again. So a squared plus b squared is c squared, etc. So 144 plus 25 is c squared. So C is 169, square root of, which is 13. The cosecant, then, is 1 over sine. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So cosecant is hypotenuse, which is 13, all over um, 
hypotenuse all over, did I say opposite? I think I said opposite. Yeah. So negative 5. Okay. It's a little harder one. Usually you could just uh, not even worry about, you know, the negatives. If that's not an issue, you can just draw the triangle like this, the way I'm boxing it in here. You just do that and not have to worry about the range with the circle. Um, let's look at the algebraic version of this. Okay. So eventually we're going to be wanting to, and it's not until Calc 2, unfortunately, we'll need to be able to rewrite um, expressions uh, that are composites of trig functions algebraically. So the cosine of arc sine of 2x. Okay, okay so what we're going to do is use a triangle to figure this out. So this arc sine thing is an angle. We'll call that theta, and we'll put that on our right triangle. And then the input of arc sine is the ratio of sides of a right triangle. Right? So 2x is the same as 2x over 1. And for arc sine, that means um, we have 2x as our um, opposite, and then 1 as our hypotenuse. Right? So on the triangle, 2x will go here, and then 1 will go here. And then you're going to use the Pythagorean theorem to get the third side. So a squared plus b squared is 2x equals 1 squared, which is 1. So the other side is the square root of 1 minus 4x squared. So the cosine of this triangle, it's uh, adjacent over hypotenuse. So that'll be 1 minus 4x squared. Square root of 1 minus 4x squared. Okay. Let's try maybe uh, one more of those. Okay. So another example. Tan of arc secant of x over 3. So secant is 1 over cosine, so it's going to be hypotenuse over adjacent. So hypotenuse is the x, the adjacent is 3. And the Pythagorean theorem on the, to get to the third side, um, we're going to have b squared equals x squared minus 3 squared, which is 9. So b will be square root x squared minus 9. I did that kind of quick. If you didn't see it, it's a... Uh, 3 squared plus b squared equals x squared originally. The leg squared, the sum of the leg squared equals um, the hypotenuse squared. Then I moved the 3 squared over, so, and then I took the square root of both sides. So this side. And you don't have to worry about the plus or minuses here. Um, maybe if, if it, you know, sometimes maybe you would, but uh, not here. Okay. Um, Tan of arc secant. So tan is opposite all over adjacent. Okay. okay. Uh, let's see what else. I think that's pretty much it. Let me see what's on uh, web assign. Do we know how to find inverses? Um, you just kind of slip swap the variables, find inverse. Maybe I can find oh well, a problem in WebAssign that's find the inverse. Sure. So number six, I have to find the inverse and um, the, the domain of both of these. Okay, so f of x is x minus 3 squared. Um, right. So generally what you, you're going to end up doing is switching the variables. That's what you probably were taught before. Apparently in the software, it doesn't look like you need to do that, though, which kind of ticks me off. Um, 
So they, they want you to find F inverse of Y, all right? So, so you're not technically switching the variables. So normally you would go X equals Y minus three squared, and then uh, take the square root on both sides. So plus or minus square root of X equals um, Y. So Y, um, yeah, equals plus or minus square root of X which wouldn't be a function. So th this original guy has to be restricted or something. Is it? Yeah, for x less than or equal to 3 is the original domain. Okay, so um, if x is less than or equal to 3, then what does this thing look like? So x squared looks like this x minus 3, shift over 1, 2, 3, so it looks like this. And then x less than or equal to 3 is just the left half. So i me put that in yellow. It's just this part of it. Okay. And then if we want its inverse, we just kind of rotate it about that line there. So it'll look like um, 0. I'm trying to figure out. So, so if this is 3, 0, 0, 3 has to be on the graph. 2, 3. So maybe up here. And then we'll go through and go up like that. Okay. Believe it or not, that is the graph of the inverse. Um, not exactly, right? Try that again. I don't want to use green. There we go, sorry. Okay, so it's going to look like that. Um, the domain of, of F inverse is positive, so you won't have this negative part. So Y equals, um, and then I lost my minus 3 somewhere. Oh, this is turning into a mess. I apologize. Uh, minus 3. So y, you add the 3 to the other side, 3 plus the square root of x. Okay? And that's f inverse of x. And, and the software, they're not doing that. So instead of swapping the variables, they're just having you uh, solve for um, x. So what does that look like? Get square root of both sides. Um, add the 3 over, and then they're going to call that f inverse of y. Okay? And of course, its domain is going from uh, negative infinity to 3. You tell that by the graph. But it's, uh, sorry, the domain is from 0 to infinity, sorry, which is basically the range of the other function. So 0 to infinity, and then the range is the domain of the original. So what did we say that was? Um, negative infinity to 3. Okay. So, um, and that should be a closed. Like that. So one thing about inverse functions, if, you, if uh, the domain of, of f is the range of f inverse and vice versa, right? The range of f is the domain of f inverse. Okay. Maybe we should look at another one of those. Hmm. Oh, this one goes back to f inverse of x. So I don't know why they're asking for f inverse of y. That just makes no sense. Is there another f inverse problem we can do? Sure. That's, that's this guy. And then they want the domain and ranges. Okay, so let's try this one. 
f of x is x squared minus 25. Square root of, and x is greater than or equal to 5. Okay, so to get f inverse, I'm just going to write this out as like this. Square both sides. If you want to switch the variables, you can. So um, even before you square both sides. Okay, so square both sides now. And then I'm going to get the, um, y, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, the y by itself, so y squared equals uh, negative x squared minus 25. And then take the square root on both sides, so y is plus or minus the square root of negative x squared minus 25. Oops, did I screw up? It should be just x. Yeah, I did. Sorry. So these are both positive. And then I need to figure out if it's the plus or the minus that I want. And uh, uh, it looks like it's going to be the plus, right? So... Um, how do I know that? When x is greater than or equal to 5, uh, let's take a look. You may just have to graph it, to kind of finagle it. I hate to be like that. Did I screw this up? Um, well, I guess the, the most direct way is probably just to graph um, this guy and then look for... Um, the, it's rotation about the uh, line y equals x, and then you can kind of decide whether it's the plus or minus. Uh, another way to think of it would be to, um, well, you, you know the domain here of f, and uh, domain of f is the interval from 5 to infinity, so you know that the, the range of... Uh, this guy here, f inverse, at the bottom of the page, must also be 5 to infinity. So for, it, for the range to be 5 to infinity, you need the plus version. Okay, so it has to be the y equals plus um, square root x squared plus 25. Okay. So anyways, the domains are there. Um, what, what's the range of this thing? In other words, what's the domain of this character? Um, I would say it's, uh, you have uh, x squared has to be greater than or equal to 0. So if you add 25 to it, it's greater than or equal to, um, well, that's not going to work, I apologize. Um, let's look on Desmos, and we can kind of pick it off there. Okay, so let's go to Desmos. I hate to use it, but oh well. Um, does most and take a look. Every once in a while, it's kind of like, eh, it was, you know, it's out there. I might as well use it. Graphing calculator. Okay, so what did I have? Um, square root of x squared minus 25. Oops. And, and so when we say x greater than um, uh, 5, we're, we're taking the branch on the right. Okay? So if we needed to graph this thing, um, the graph of f is this thing right here. 
Okay, so to get the graph of F inverse, what we do is just rotate that about the line Y equals X. And what we end up with is this guy right here. Okay, so it looks like the um, domain of F inverse must be zero to infinity. Okay? And we could go ahead and graph that guy as well. So there's a plus and a minus version. So our, ours is the plus version because our, our y values are positive. Okay, so let's go ahead and graph the other guy, x squared plus 25. y equals square root of x squared plus 25. Okay. And, um, oops, I don't want to do that. And you can see what, what, what the answer is, the positive branch is the branch on the right, okay? Um, uh, sorry, uh, let's look at y equals um, negative square root of x squared plus 25. So it's actually, yeah, the, the blue one is the positive branch, and then there's a green one, which is the negative branch. We want the blue one, okay? But even there, we have to restrict it, right? We have to restrict the blue one to have a domain from zero to infinity. Otherwise, it wouldn't be invertible either. So this one is just a nightmare. I'm glad I did, sort of did it for you. Um, anyways, at the end of the day, uh, f of x, what do we say, f of x is the square root, I think we said x squared minus 25. Its domain is from uh, 5 to infinity, and then its range, we can kind of take a look at its range, uh, and we're dealing with this thing, this yellow guy, that's 0 to infinity, so the possible y values. Sorry, still in yellow. And then the inverse function, uh, f inverse of x, we found to be square root of x squared plus 25, the, the positive version, which is the blue branch, not the green branch. And on top of that, we have to restrict the domain of that branch to be going from zero to infinity. And then of course its range will just be the domain of F, which is five to infinity. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, thank you if you <laughs> bared with me through the end of that. Um, I apologize for the little mistakes. I hadn't prepared that uh, web assign. I don't usually prepare the web assign problems, so I apologize. Um, okay, we'll see you next time.